to those back home. If possible, I don't know how to spread this kind of message to everybody. If possible, even go to the schools or maybe Nigerian schools, maybe if they have any forum, all the Nigerian universities, I mean, all the universities around to really tell all the blacks, Nigerians especially, say, look, this is how this country runs. And, you know, many people have been here, but they don't really know all these things. I didn't really, I didn't know. I didn't know. Honestly, I didn't know. And it's unfortunate that uh, I was caught up in all these things, not knowing, but I just pray that God will see me through in all, you know, in what I'm passing through. Thanks to Mr. Ola, who has really come to my help and all that. So I'm just saying that everybody should have a way of disseminating this information to others to learn. It's important. Thank you. You're welcome, my brother. It's really important, like he said, that um, we begin to learn these things because the issue here is that we're coming from a different culture completely. And this is why I said that when we people come here, we are traveling a journey, we're on a journey, and we need to um, begin to learn that we are in a different culture completely. And it sometimes could be a huge culture shock. And what you said is true, Mr. Innocent. Assuming people have opportunity to learn before they even come, that would be more helpful because yeah. prevention is better than cure. And oh. knowledge is power. And uh, they say experience is a, a teacher, but experience is a very wicked teacher. <laughs> by the time, yes, by the time you, you, you go through it to get the experience, you've been bruised. And some of those bruises will relieve scars for the rest of your life. So it's much better. My father said, yes, uh, experience, experience, but a wise person learn from what happened to another person. You don't need to wait for it to happen to you. So, and this is why we are making the time to, to sensitize our community, to teach our people. And this is why Mr. Ola has been saying to people, can we put our money where our mouth is? Uh, this work, I've been doing it for the past two years with Mr. Ola. Ask him, he's here. I've been doing it as a free will donation to the community. My time and my resources for the past two years, I've been to Middlesbrough in person to, this, do, to do this work, all the way from Watford. You know the distance that's, I'm talking about. Not, so, so please, let's, let's take this thing serious and begin to put our, our, our money where our mouth is. Because if I were to uh, 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 deliver uh, trainings or consultations somewhere else, I know how much I would charge to do that. But I'm doing this free for our people. But only to open, so just to open our cameras. People who even open their camera. If the people signed to, uh, to come. They wouldn't, they wouldn't come. And we say make voluntary donations so that we can continue doing this work. Nobody wants to make the donation. Yet, when you enter into trouble, what it will cost you? The pain and agony and the money you used to pay solicitors. You cannot begin to quantify it. But we take it for granted. Let's learn this thing. Let's learn that we are in the UK. This is where the, the, a society where law operates. The Children Act 1989 operates. Domestic Violence Act operates. Let's learn it and begin to adjust to the reality of where we are living. That's all I want to say. Ch Mr. Chidoze, your hand is up. Yeah. Um, good evening. Uh, please, I just have um, just a little question to ask, but before then, um, I just want to know, um, we're back home in Africa, I, I believe we have standards of how we raise our children. And um, to me, can't we have that standard, that's, that standard we develop in Africa of how we raise our children? Can't we put in that as African children in this particular place? That's my first question. Second question is, now, most of us came in here, we don't know of all these things and we enter into this. Now, thank God for Mr. Wale who has been there for us. I want to appreciate it for that. Now, most of us enter into these things unknowingly. Now, you were talking about emotional abuse. Probably there's somehow, somehow, because you don't know before you came in here, and your children or your son or your child went ahead and complained and said you were, you, he was emotionally abused. In that case, now what will you do? If a social worker comes to you and says, okay, now, even if you don't do that, now just accept that you do it or just accept 
that okay, you did you did it or not just say you don't do you didn't do it, but you are open for correction. So in that case, in this case, do you accept what the social worker is saying that okay, uh, you are open for correction, though you did not agree to it or you agree to it, but you are open for correction. So that's my second question. So please, can you explain? I just need more clarity in all these things. Thank you. I see that our guest is in the room. Um, do you want to welcome her or should I answer the questions, Mr. Answer Hunt? the question, please, please. You can answer the question. I've welcomed her in the chat. I, okay. I just want to understand that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So thanks, uh, Mr. Chidose. So your first question, you said back home we have standards how we raise children. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. That, how, why can't we do the same here? Yes, yes, please. I, I understand you, but uh, can I explain to you there's a difference how we live back home and how this the Western world live. This is where the challenge is. Back home, we live a communal life, yeah? You know, the, the other that says it takes a village to raise a child. That's how we live back home. But here we, uh, in the Western world, people live very individualistic life. So that, that is already a very clear distinction for you. So back home, if my child is misbehaving and you, Mr. Chidoje, you see her, you will correct her straight away. You will not even wait for me before you correct my child. That's, that's it all. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that, that is a typical example. But here you cannot do it. That's how it is. So that will show you the difference, how we raise children back home and how this country is. So here there's law and regulation for everything. That's our communal life, how we support each other and agree how we do things and what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And we have a common knowledge and agreement of it. It's not quite how it is here. How it is here, the law stipulates how everything is done. So if you don't do it according to how the law stipulates it, you'll be bridging the law. That is where the, the distinction is. Secondly, you know, the right to family life is a qualified uh, right here. The, the state can interfere in family life, just like they can interfere in the right to freedom. If you commit offense, they can put you, anybody, you can go to jail. So that, for, that right that I call fundamental right is qualified. But back home, you know, the, 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 the state does not interfere in the family life. Nobody will come to your house, Mr. Chidoze, and say to you, You've, uh, you, you, yeah, you smack your daughter, I will take away your daughter. Nobody does that back home. You must have done something very serious before the police will get involved. So that is a clear distinction. But my suggestion for us is let's take the best of what we have back home and take the best of what is here. I will make international students, I mean international children. Because don't forget these children we are raising here. They're, just, they're no longer just Africans. They're Africans and also British. They're actually international uh, children. They're international citizens at the end of the day. So let's take the best from them. Thank you, and thank the best you very from much, Ma. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We are, we are training, we are building a global child. We are yeah. building a global child. Anywhere they find themselves, they should be able to live a good life, quality of life. I welcome Paula Madison. You're welcome for joining us. Uh, before we bring you on board, I would like to give... Uh, Mr. Adedigba, to see his hand up. I asked two questions. I know the second question. Um, so your second question about um, if the social worker said, um, just accept that you're open to correction, right? Is that the second question? Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so the like I said to you, I'm a social worker. Um, the, the, the first thing we do uh, is, okay, we have two functions, broadly speaking, care and control. That is our, uh, that's how it's defined. So in our care function, before we even control in terms of child protection and all that, our first job is to support, yeah? So if we see that you're a new person, uh, a good social worker, I think that a new migrant, you don't really understand the system very well, they should give you the benefit of doubt to give you proper training. So they can send you for parenting training, for example, so that you learn what is expected of you to understand the needs of a child and how to discipline a child or how to raise your child properly here. So that's the first quest, uh, position. So maybe that's what the social worker is trying to say that you should be open to correction, even if you didn't know. 
So in that way, you can go for training, like the kind of training that I offer. Then you learn how different strategies to raise your child here and make sure you are working in line with regulation and you are not found wanting of any sort of safeguarding concern. We can talk more about this later. Let me take the last question, Dr. Joshua. Dr. Joshua, I did it back before Dr. Joshua, please. I did it back, are you there? How did I did it back? All right, uh, Mr. Ola, good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening uh, I think what I wanted to say, the counselor, she has just been able to address it uh, somehow in a in, in a talk point. Uh, and it's about be, be, being able to blend our African culture with the parenting, uh, whatever parenting style or parenting strategies we choose to adopt in the foreign line, like in abroad, uh, Europe here. Uh, and like in, my, in African uh, proverb, we say that whoever has lost uh, the, 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 the memory of, of their land or of their ancestors have, have, have thrown away the, the dignity and heritage of their household. Uh, I want to borrow a leaf from the Asians. Uh, I, I know everywhere I've, I've been to different parts of Europe at one point or the other, and I know I, wherever I go, they kind of behave the same way. Uh, you see a strong heritage of Asians bringing, at least from the perspective of what I see, they speak their language locally to their children. As a matter of fact, most likely will be the natural first language for them to learn. Uh, and of course, at the same time, you see, when you see those children grow up, you find out that they, they are well suited, they are blended into the culture and society they are living in, which is not different from where they are coming from. But at the same time, they have very good understanding of the culture where they, their parents came from. Uh, we as African, uh, especially Nigerians, as the case may be, uh, maybe we've not gotten to that point. I'm going to do so much of work required to be done. And that's what Councillor and Mr. People like Mr. Ola bring it to the forefront of discussion right now. Uh, maybe we need to take our time individually or as a team, or as the case may be, identify those things that are anachronistic in our culture and be able to allow them to see these are the things we can't, we shouldn't be bringing abroad or should be talking about or be living through while we are abroad or we are living in, in, in places like UK like this. Why we focus on cultural practices, cultural beliefs that may be able to, of course, give our children a better life and make them stronger. Uh, why, let me link it back to the previous question, today's international men's day, we're talking about uh, men's health and all those things. Uh, in Africa, we believe that men are strong uh, and therefore men, a man does not have any right to show weakness. Uh, and that's the, that's the reason why, of course, we're talking about suicide rate and all of those things. It's a natural default. If you see an African my brother, I'm a man. I'm not supposed to show a sign of weakness. And therefore, because of that, we are, we are open, we are, we are exposed to a lot of, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, internal uh, issues with ourselves and that may end up leading to some other mental issues, which we may not even agree to or uh, accept as the case may be. So then we need to break that side, that particular belief that uh, men are first human before being men, and therefore there is no man, there is no human that cannot go through mental issues, and therefore we all need to be properly aware and protect of ourselves. Uh, the last talk point basically will then be about uh, being able to uh, take care of our children in the right of the law of what wherever we are living. In. There, there is no excuse for ignorance, ignorance of the law, and, and I'm sure one way or the other. Uh, we are learning so much from here. So our ability to understand the law of the land where we are living in and being able to uh, live within the context of that law and also promote the, of course, the, the, the what we call it, the progress and the development of our families will help us in the long run. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. In a quick way, please, uh, Dr. Ateke Joshua, please. Uh, let it be fast. Thank you, sir. Okay, my only just are we live already? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If we are live already, I'll I'll, I'll get I'll ask you my questions later. Thank you, thank you very uh, much. It's been an awesome lesson. Okay, we, we we take your question when we finish with the live session. Yeah, but yeah. Mr. Daddy, but just to clarify, um, when when I'm saying that we should learn the laws of the land, um, I'm not saying we should throw away our culture. I'm saying we take the best of what we have, uh, because there are so many good things in our culture. Um, like I gave an example with my daughter and I said, uh, if she's talking to an adult and she's not making eye contact, it doesn't mean that she's being dis disrespectful. It's a sign of respect in our culture. And I like that she's maintaining it. 
And when she sees you now, Mr. Dedibo, because she knows you are, an uncle, uh, you are Nigerian, she will greet you kneeling down, saying, uncle, good evening. That is our culture. It, 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 but when she sees a, a, her teachers that are white, she wouldn't do that because it, she knows it's not their culture. So these children are very smart. They know where to differentiate the cultures very well. And that's what I mean that we're raising international citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I welcome our uh, second facilitator, uh, I want to recognize the presence of our president, Nigerian community in Tayside, Dr. Tola Shejayoba. Thank you so much for joining community issues and concern. If you just have a one or two minutes to just greet everyone of us, sir. Thank you for joining, sir. Uh, God bless you, okay. sir. Oh, thank you for having me here today. I am happy to be part of this uh, program. And thank you to Mr. Ola for organizing this uh, session uh, because um, I've been in this, uh, I've joined in for some time now. And I've had and I've listened to different questions and the way they have been answered since. And um, I am so happy that um, this kind of forum is uh, actually happening here. And I'm so happy that um, we have uh, our, our auntie who has been answering all these questions with us as well. She has been giving uh, so much light into so many issues around uh, the uh, in our community, and I'm so happy that uh, this is uh, happening. And another thing is, uh, please, uh, all these things that our uh, auntie has been saying to us, they are real, and this are just the way things are done here in this country. If it is always good when we have enough information. And the information helps us to live well, and for us to be, it guides us. It also guides us to 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 do things so that we don't we don't make some mistakes. There are some mistakes that are too uh, expensive, you know. And uh, attending such a um, section, it, it, it helps us to have information to understand what is happening in our environment and. Um, I'm so happy and grateful that uh, Mr. Ola is also doing something like this. And I'm so happy for all of us that are here tonight because I know uh, before the end of this session, we will learn one or two things today, which will also help us, you know, for our, for future purpose in this community. So thank you very much for, and I'm so happy that I'm, I'm here tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So without wasting much of our time, I will move on to our next facilitator. Today's International Men's Day. I know she's here to bless us and also to support our men, you know, to give you that courage to, 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 to seek for help. Uh, I will allow Paula Madison Green to introduce herself. Paula Madison, thank you for finding time to be part of this. Thank you for reaching out. Thank you. Um, and thank you personally, Mr. Ola, um, for your invite and for everyone to um, invite me to this session this evening. Um, and congratulations with it being International Men's Day. So I run um, a social enterprise in the UK called Trauma Stop UK CIC. And uh, many years ago, back in 2015, um, I experienced personal domestic abuse myself um, and reached out to the services. Um, and I found that there was quite a mixed response, um, both from the statutory agencies and from the third sector. Um, and as a result of that, um, I then went onto Facebook and set up, um, without even realizing it, um, uh, something called the Northeast Women and Men's uh, Domestic Violence Abuse Service. Um, and historically in the UK, what has happened is that um, male domestic abuse services have been quite separate. Um, so we have um, a male domestic abuse service called Mankind Initiative, which I'm highly supportive of. And there are smaller projects throughout the, the UK. Um, and this addresses the support needs of men who have been subject to domestic abuse. Um, 
men inherently in the UK have have not really come forward. Um, and it's a bit like a cultural thing, like um, uh, the good gentleman was explaining um, that uh, sometimes it's to do with culture um, within the UK. Sometimes it's to do with um, people's belief systems. And also as well, it's to do with um, historically how the way that things have always happened. Um, but over the since the Domestic Abuse Act came into force, um, which was in 2021, um, I think the that has cleared a lot of um, kind of grey areas, shall we say, um, with regards to domestic abuse, and it has created for the statutory agencies a very defined definition of domestic abuse, because previously and historically people didn't understand what domestic abuse was. So some people thought domestic abuse was if somebody got a black eye um, and it was a physical punishment. Um, other people didn't imagine um, that it was um, to do with financial abuse and other people um, didn't realise that it was to do with um, what was called coercive and controlling um, behaviour, um, which is behaviour that's used to threaten and intimidate somebody. So the law, with it, the law coming and the law changing things, um, I think that all the statutory agencies um, and the third sector are now getting on board with um, the actual definition as to what domestic abuse is. And I'm very pleased to see that, um, that male domestic abuse is now being recognised. When I first started running in 2015, um, it was mainly women that would text me through my Facebook page. Um, and then every now and again, I would get a man who'd kind of ask me, um, so you say that you deal with men, but actually you're a woman, Paula. Um, and I, I must admit, personally, it did make me question myself. Um, and after a little while, I just used to listen to them and say kind of like, so what what do you feel that you need support with? And then gradually these men would come forward. And then if they had somebody that they knew that would be prepared to kind of disclose confidentially to me some of the abuse that was happening, um, then basically um, over time, this kind of grew. And then eventually I had two or three gentlemen who used to text me quite regularly and explain how they were feeling. They were feeling very, very upset. Um, some of them had the threat of their children to be removed from them um, by a female perpetrator. And some men indeed were in homosexual relationships too, because domestic abuse isn't just doesn't just happen from female perpetrators. It can um, happen from intimate partner violence within the LGBTQ community as well. So um, the statutory agencies, and just for statistical purposes, um, and I've taken these statistics from the Mankind Initiative, um, the Office of National Statistics show every year that one in every three victims of domestic abuse are male, which equates to 757,000 men, um, male to female perpetrated, oh, sorry, female to male perpetrated abuse. But that I think also includes the um, LGBTQ um, figures as well. Um, and apparently, um, again, according to the um, research statistics published by Mankind Initiative, 26% of reported domestic abuse crimes were committed against men. Um, and yet, only 4.4% of uh, male victims are being supported by local domestic abuse services. So what that tells me, um, and from my experience since 2015, is that there, there is male um, domestic abuse that is actually happening, but a lot of it is not being reported. Um, and so um, what, we, what, what I want to try and do is to say to people, that um, it's something not to be embarrassed about and that you can come forward. And, uh, and I'm very um, keen to work collaboratively with organisations like yourselves um, so that we can kind of um, break down this, um, these kind of stigmas um, about domestic abuse, um, female to male perpetrated um, abuse, because one of the biggest worries that um, men have is the fear of not being believed, the fear of embarrassment, um, and, uh, and and there is distinct differences between male to female perpetrated abuse, in my professional opinion, and female to male perpetrated abuse. Um, if it's a female that is um, having domestic abuse against a male, 
inherently through the experience that I have, um, females tend to um, sometimes if they were going to be physical with a man, it may be that they bite them in places. So on the genitals, um, around the, the, the neck area, but not where you could actually see whether um, where there's often a, a male to female perpetrated abuse. They like to um, physically, if they were going to be abusive, they may um, have what's called a trophy injury. So it may be a black eye or something that's very visible that other people would be able to see. Um, Ultimately, all abuse is wrong. Um, and uh, and also within, like you were, I was just very interested to um, hear you talking about, um, about the practices that happen. Um, so I actually understand where, where you're all kind of, what, what, what you've just been talking about, because in my, I was going to say in my day, but when I was a little girl, we still had in the UK corporal punishment. So, for example, I if, when I was at school, we would get the cane. So as we would have the head teacher and he would have a big stick and he would lash us on the hand um, if we were misbehaving. But things um, have completely changed. But for somebody of my age, age 53, it's um, it can be very difficult um, if you're a parent, because um, often we copy what our parents have taught us. Um, so we need to um, be more aware. Uh, and like the good gentleman said, we need to understand the laws in the UK and how things have changed. Um, and also we need to look at our roles as parents, because men no longer, um, it's, it's not seen anymore as a strength um uh to to be the strong one and to um kind of the person that kind of gives the punishment to the children um and there are lots of strategies that um like uh the counselor auntie said um that where safeguarding as long as there's no safeguarding issues then social services and social workers are there to help support families that's the reason why social work came into the uk um, and uh, it was to support families in social settings in order to help them, their children to thrive, in order to help the family unit um, to thrive and be given the right level of support. That's the reason why originally, historically in the UK, social services came to being. And that's why we then developed community midwife teams, uh, community health visitor teams. Um, so uh, has anybody got any questions for me? Any question? Let it be interactive. Yeah. I'll just, I'll add one point. Um, the, the gentleman made a good point about you um, not making eye contact because we're respectful of one another. I do think that, that we do have, this is the case also with children with autism, for example, in the UK. And so I believe that we as a community within the UK as part of our national citizenship program, um, maybe we should even be building in um, kind of what is domestic abuse into the national citizenship program. Uh, it would be a good idea for people who are coming into the UK for the first time. Um, but uh, it's really difficult because we also within the UK, um, if we are, we have always adopted habits um, within our statutory agencies and within our third sector, we also have to be more understanding of the um, cultural differences and the cultural beliefs of other communities who are ethnically minoritized in the UK. Um, and there is a lot of work still to do there. Um, so I can take questions about domestic abuse relating to uh, men who are being domestically abused. Yep, Dr. Ole. Go ahead, what's your question, please? Dr. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you so much, um, Paula, for your speech so far. Um, uh, I don't, from what you were saying, uh, I found uh, a lot of things quite informative and quite interesting as well. Um, when you talked about how, how when you were a child, um, and there's sort of um, um, you had the corporal punishments and stuff in schools and and some of those things that still sort of happen. Um, talking about where we come from, from Nigeria, uh, the question is how did you, 
how did uh, you guys come to uh, become more, um, I mean, make that switch from how it, things were then to now, you know, and trying to adapt to it. What, what, what sort of advice is, would, you, would you give, you know, how you have uh, changed some certain ways of disciplining children to now? Yeah, I think, um, I think personally it's happened um, intergenerationally. So as each generation, new generation has been born, then they've become more aware. So I think his, uh, chronologically over the years, things have got better. However, um, when the Children's Act came into force um, and corporal punishment was abolished, then um, I think that I believe that the when there were test cases of specific people that were punished for hitting their children um, to the extent where they were really injuring their children. Um, I think that with the television and social media, uh, which it wasn't around in them days, but when it was on TV and uh, it was in the newspapers and people started reading about it, then people were kind of talked within the communities. Um, I come from a very close knit small village um, community. And so people were talking over the garden fences to one another and said, oh, crikey, did you know that this was not right? Um, and I'm hoping that that's what will happen within the UK with the Domestic Abuse Act. The statistics are still within the UK that 10% of people feel it's perfectly acceptable to, for example, hit a woman. Um, so it's kind of everybody is not buying into the laws and the rules that we have. Um, so we have obviously within the UK, we've got the rule of law, um, we also have liberty and we also have um, the, uh, uh, the the other kind of um, rules that we have, basically. Um, so it's just basically, I think, um, just coming on board with it in time, but, um, but making sure that um, in terms of the Domestic Abuse Act, um, it doesn't, if you're not with that other person, um, you're still classed now as, as a linked with the other person. So even if you have left an abusive relationship um, and you've got out um, under this new law, what it says is you'll still be personally connected um, and that can relate to children and it could be relating to the fact that you still share a house or but maybe that you're not living in the house. Um, uh, and what had happened previously under the law um, around domestic abuse was once that person had left that relationship, um, many years ago, they weren't classed as personally connected. So the statutory agencies like social services, like the police would say, well, you're not in a relationship anymore. And yet sometimes the abuse still continues more than often it does. So it, even though the person may be not being physically assaulted or hit, um, then it may be that, especially now, um, people can use social media to stalk and harass people. People can um, use um, other people against each other. And sometimes even at the moment, I know a lot of cases with uh, male victims where the female perpetrator is using the law to, to her advantage in order to deprive that other person materialistically and financially. So it's very important, um, not just to yourselves, but to, to have these conversations with what I call safe people like myself, to kind of, uh, we don't need to go into, um, unless, unless you actually di disclose the fact that someone is assaulting, assaulting you or that you intend to assault or physically injure or harm another person. My agency um, is completely confidential in, and independent. So you can get, um, you know, um, advice and guidance um, and we can talk about it as though it was a third person that this was happening about. Because in my understanding, I would much rather that somebody um, gained my trust and I gained their trust to be able to help to support them, to pass them on to, for example, auntie, so that she can support the family rather than kind of the situation growing and then exploding and then the whole family unit being completely shattered. Um, and because I think we need to be ad adopting, especially in ethnically minoritized communities, a very proactive approach um, rather than a reactive approach. And this is what I see 
And this is why there are so many people that don't come forward because they don't report because they say, oh, I'll get my children taken from me. Um, and, uh, oh, I won't do this because then uh, I won't be able to live in the house. And then they may be in economically at, or financially at a disadvantage. And inherently, I was looking up the research from um, about Nigeria um, too. And that was saying that uh, uh, in 2013, um, in a demographic and health survey in Nigeria, 23% of women indicated domestic abuse in within their relationship um, in the last 12 months. Um, but a lot of the links were related to non-cash work. Um, and there was a greater um, male approval for wife beating, for example, um, in Nigeria. So there are historically uh, a lot of cultural beliefs that we all saw, you're quite right, that we do have to get right. Um, and it's very difficult, you know, we're trying to, if you're trying to join up what, what was your culture from before, how you've been brought up as a small child, um, uh, and then kind of bring it into a westernized kind of society where we have all these very strict rules. It is, it feels uncomfortable. And it also um, tech feels probably like we're having our culture taken away from us. Um, so it's difficult, but with the right conversations, then we can hopefully move forward and get some joined up um, working together so that you feel happier. Somebody has the, is it uh, uh, Coyote? Coyote, yeah. Coyote, yeah. Uh, have you got a question, please? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, thank you very much, Paula. Um, good uh, discussion. Uh, however, what I wanted to talk about briefly or just ask uh, informally would just be around the issue of trust. So I, did, I know you did mention a bit around that. However, it's still an issue. Uh, I have seen, this is first-hand and uh, both reported and first-hand accounts of cases in this UK where people have gone to ask for support, particularly Africans. And the whole case was blown out of proportion. Uh, it was not well handled. Issues that could have just been an issue of support, maybe child in need, or even nothing got into that point at all. Uh, issues relating to language uh, misunderstanding, not understanding the context of the African culture uh, and quite a whole lot of things. I can't even give the details here. I've happened and what I've realized after that is that I've seen people who might have been struggling or who might need support, not wanting to come forward to ask for support from the authorities because they don't know who to trust. Uh, and that when that trust is misplaced, it's difficult for there to be a connection and that needs to be properly worked around. Uh, I, I, I'm sure you want people to come to the authorities to be able to see for help and people who really want to do that. But when trust is lost and there's no connection, then that's an issue. Uh, nobody wants to just sit down and be struggling with their personal matters, apparently, if they have. But when they believe that rather than being supported, they actually end up getting in a more messier situation. So what are you and the team or the authority, what are they doing to really get this sorted out? Uh, particularly with the area of understanding, I, I appreciate the fact that you've gone to look at the history, uh, the research on Nigeria, the abuse case and all of it. But just like the counselor was saying earlier, there's so much to understand about the African and particularly Nigerian culture. There's so much of good stuff in Nigeria. I, if I want to tell you, I can take you through a course of 10 reasons why an African child might be, you know, then things that you know when when you are an African child or you grow up in Africa will make you a better child, and I, it's an example of things that are coming out of Africa. So context of, of trust, and then how we can get the, the authorities to really get to understand our culture and be able to support us culturally speaking. Those are the two areas I want you to look at. Um, well, I'm a realist. Um, <laughs> I think probably because of my age, um, I don't think that this this will happen overnight. Um, I think that it takes commitment on behalf of um, certain individuals in society to raise the profile personally. Um, and this is the reason why I'm here tonight, because I would like to be that person to, I suppose, cross the bridge um, and to extend the hand to say, kind of let's try 
let's try it because um, without people coming forward in society and uh, wanting to find out and being interested in other cultures, how on earth can we um, kind of uh, work collaboratively better together? Um, I can't answer for any statutory agencies. I can't answer for any of the frontline or even the third sector. All I can answer for is myself, which is my little charity. And it's only me at this moment in time. Um, uh, however, I, you know, um, I have lots of friends who um, are uh, African. Um, I was talking to a lady from another charity in Malawi the other day, um, and she was having issues to do with um, the LGBTQ community in terms of the fact that she couldn't get the, her own government to support them. So I know it's it's not just a problem here; it's across right across the world. Um, but unless we start to work together. Um, and start to, um, even in small way possibly, um, may, and what I've suggested that I can do is to offer um, a workshop to help men who might, who, who come forward, who would just, let's just say that they're interested in, um, if, if they were a male victim of domestic abuse, um, to understand what domestic abuse is in a little bit more depth. So it's rather than kind of talking about individual cases as a first step, what my proposal was is perhaps maybe I can run some training sessions um, alongside this charity and uh, and then we can answer a lot of the questions through the course. Um, and that way you are not disclosing your personal information to me um, and therefore you will feel safer. And then once you know, once I know you and once um, within a group situation, um, then maybe you'll feel comfortable to come to see me on a one to one or to come and I can come into the buildings where you have your um, your discussions. Um, so I'm happy to go to you as well. I went to the I went and lived with um, the Himba tribe in Africa um, for a month and uh, and it was a really, really great experience that I had. Um, but in terms of the cultures, um, it was quite surprising for myself um, uh, to understand, first of all, the levels of poverty that were back in, in for example, in Namibia, um, and also the practices of how things were done and in terms of the roles within that particular village where I lived. So um, I think maybe more than other people, I have more of a cultural awareness, um, but I have so much more to learn and I can't possibly know unless I have people like yourselves who are helping me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, do we have any other questions before she... Yeah, I've got a question. My hand's up. My hand is raised up. Okay. So... Right, Doctor. Yeah, uh, just a quick one. Um, um, my question goes like this. Um, so, uh, being a doctor, um, you have patients who come to you to confide in you who are adults and tell you, disclose to you about uh, their partners being uh, uh, abusive physically with them, you know, hit them or uh, controlling, you know. Uh, but you, you, I mean, trying to appreciate that difficulty which, which comes with their trust. But then they, they say they don't want to sort of, uh, they don't want, uh, that there was any sort of referrals, you know, and then you are kind of, kind of stuck to say, okay, uh, I know, okay, so now, so they're coming to you to saying that, you know, it's affected, having an impact on their mental health, you know, crying and you know, feeling sad and all of that, you know, and you've explored and explored, you've seen that, okay, because of the, the abuse going on or the violence going on at home, this is the reason why their mental health is sort of struggling. And you're trying to sort of su suggest to them that, okay, because they've got their the consent, they're adults, um, and you're trying to suggest to them that, do you not think trying to get seek appropriate help for this uh, will be a good step in the right direction to, you know, solve the issue, triggering, making your mental health, health worse, you know, as opposed to coming to uh, look for a magical pill and stuff. But then the, the, the person sort of um, takes, takes, continues on, on the path of not wanting to, uh, not wanting any referrals and then, um, not wanting to deal with that issue, you know, or because of fears about what it will lead to, the person getting into trouble and all of that. How do you, uh, you know, just trying to borrow a leaf of how you, you know, you address those situations, you know, what, what sort of advice would you give in trying to, would you, would you ignore their, or, I mean, autonomy, you know, and 
uh, refer them anyways, or would you, or would you sort of support them a bit more to make that step by themselves? And what, 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 what's your take on it? Yeah. So when when someone comes to me, if somebody disclosed, uh, and this is what I would be very open and frank with them, and say, kind of before we start to have discussions, um, if you are going to tell me that you are um, being abused right here, right now, then I have a duty of what's called a duty of care to report that to a statutory agency. So we, um, if that is the case, then um, I can help you to do that and I can support you to do it. And I have with male, male victims, I've actually physically gone to the police station with them um, and kind of um, sat with them and um, explained the process and that kind of thing if they've wanted to. But taking your point into consideration, um, we I would have set I would set up a contract with them because um I form part of the um well I'm an associate member of the BABCP and also I'm a member of the ACCPH as a therapist. So um I have to be fully aware of what my role and remit is and where the boundaries would be crossed. So what we could do is we could have what I call a safe conversation about someone's somebody who they know um whose name shall remain anonymous as friend to say this is the this is my friend my friend is called jack and this is the situation that jack is in so jack is experiencing intimate partner violence um on a daily basis and um he is sustaining injuries but he doesn't know what to do he has two children um can you give me some advice and guidance and can we talk about kind of the the pros and the cons if Jack chooses to live to leave that relationship um, and so that I would be very happy to talk um, with somebody along those lines to explain um, the situation to them. Um, there have been um, there is there's been one gentleman that um, has always refused to give me his details for about three years um and i still support him now because i believe that in maybe another year's time when he has the courage and he feels safe enough um that he will be able to um uh leave his his relationship um but at this moment in time and i've given him lots of advice and guidance um but i don't have his details he refused to give me his details but i would rather keep someone like him safe by him knowing that I am here and that I'm around. And uh, and if there is um, a crisis situation, I know 100% that I would be the first person that he would pick up the phone to. Um, and we have made an agreement that um, if he has evidence um, that he can, that I will, I'm, a, I'm able to um, store that evidence um, for him. So we have a contract, but it's basically, I don't have his full details. And that's why I'm completely independent as well. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, I generally would never ever store anyone's details um, apart from kind of like very, very basic information. Um, I do believe that there is a need for this kind of a service because, and, um, and eventually most of the people, in fact, 99.9% .9 of the people with my support in the right way have gone to the likes of Auntie and reported and said, look, we have, you know, worries. This is what appears to be happening. Um, what kind of support can, for example, social services give us if this was to be happening in this situation? Um, so um, and then basically the statutory agencies, if you if you can get a social worker, for example, that's like really, really um, good and they understand the culture, then I think that um, like Auntie, you will be able to work with someone like her. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the police, there are um, kind of there is a desk which is called the domestic the dv desk or the domestic abuse desk and so instead of speaking to um a, just a general officer of the law if there is a, a genuine issue um then if you wanted to for example do a check on someone to see if they were safe we have what's called a claire's law check um that we can do on somebody that you may be intending on having an intimate relationship with and if there are any police markers from a previous assault or domestic abuse history on that person, you, the police will be very happy to, um, to do the checks for you of that other person. So that if you were a person, um, a man with children, 
um, and you were wanting to go into a relationship, you can get that other person checked to make sure that they, um, wherever as far as reasonably practical, are safe. And the same as well for if you have any cons, if you're kind of wanting to make sure that that person doesn't have any offences against children, um, you can do what is called a Sarah's Law check um, through the police, and the police are very happy to support you um, with with you know things like this. Thank so, you, thank you very much for that. I think uh, uh, that's the last person's question. I want to say thank you very much for finding time to be on this platform again. And we look forward to definitely take this further and uh, to see how best to work in collaborative and to support the community in general. So once again, thank you for joining us. Innocent, what hand is that? Before well, I wanted to ask the lady something. Is she gone? I want to release her. Okay. I'm, I'm, no, I'm still here. I'm still here. Okay. Uh, just one more. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for your work that you do. No problem. I just want to find out. Um, in your work, you know, with people, I haven't gone to Africa and back, and you see the cultural difference. No. So is there a way you can push for, for the government? When I mean government, I'm talking of the UK government now, to make it as a point of duty maybe at the point of entry, whereby anybody coming in probably for the first time, not, not visit anyway, anybody coming in, student or whatever, to have a long stay, to make it as a point of duty, to print out, even if it's leaflet, to say, look, now that you're coming into the country, ensure you read this, you read that, so that you don't get into trouble. At the point of entry, so that these issues of people coming in and being not aware of um, the laws of the land coming to, in a, to a different place. I believe your organization should be able to push forward such things and make it compulsory that anybody coming into the country must, as a necessity, have that document or probably a website so that you will see that these things will be reduced to the barest minimum. So I'm just asking if you have not done that, maybe try and push if there should be a legislation to make it compulsory for the government to do that. Thank you. Maybe with yourselves in response, <laughs> uh, with your organisation and anti, we could do that and we could write a joint letter to the government and say, um, would it would this be possible? Because these this with our research today is what we've found. I think that uh, there'll be a minister in government that um, probably would welcome that idea. So thank you, Innocent. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Paula, for coming. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased because we need allies um, across the divide. So I'm really pleased, particularly how you've come to our level to understand where we are coming from. I, I actually noticed that the way my people refer to me as auntie, you also refer to me like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that shows that you're willing to you know, work, work with us because other people wouldn't do that. Uh, because it's not your, it's not cultural with, in the Western world to refer to someone that is not your auntie as auntie. And the reason they refer to me as auntie is not that I'm biologically related to everyone, but it's our culture. It's just a sign of respect. It's not that I'm older than everyone here either, but it's just a sign of respect is somebody that is in a position of authority that is kind of working with you to help you. So it's just a way of appreciating what you're doing. So thank you for that. No, the other thank thing you. is that is is uh, thank you, innocent. It's our responsibility, honestly, as politicians. Uh, we are in my head now as a councillor, not the other way around, to push for some of these things. And also in the third sector, like what we're doing in the voluntary sector, to also push for it because it's you know uh, we need we need to come to the table as well. We can't wait for everything. We have to also demand by our own advocacy to say this is what is affecting our people more and we take steps to achieve that result so we work with someone with Paula and uh, an organization like Africa to make sure we develop some materials and information to to help our people and prevent some of this agony that we are going through thank you so much for coming Paula no problem, Auntie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And if you need any other help or support, or uh, I'll hundred percent behind you, this organisation to um, take things forward. Thank you. Bye bye. Now I'm going. To, I'm going to leave. Is that okay? Can I leave thank, now? Thank you for that. Bye bye. See you. Talk to you later. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.
Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, Ross, should we stop live then? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Those of you that you are watching us on YouTube, we say thank you for joining us. Uh, for every one of us, there's an event coming up this coming Wednesday. There's an event coming up this Wednesday. I'm trying to look for that event. It's happening at Tisa University in Middlesbrough. We need all of you to be part of this. It's very, very important for all family to be part of this. If you are here to book your ticket, the ticket is going faster. Please make sure you book your ticket. I'm going to share this with you now. It's an event coming up uh, this Wednesday, 5 p.m. at Tisa University Building. And uh, the cough building, uh, room 1.01, keeping family safe and eight crime awareness, case study of African community. Those of you that you are migrating, when you start working, when you start anywhere you go to, you start understanding why it is very, very important to create awareness on eight crime, particularly to also talk about Afrophobia racism. Youth Path Coalition UK will be talking about their research, their findings, and the recommendations. And not only that, the Chief Crown Prosecutor for Crown Prosecution Service Northeast, she's going to be one of the speakers. And the team at Crown Prosecution Service will be leading that conversation on awareness. And we also got team from Cleveland Police. Uh, they will also be talking about around that support that is available. Please don't forget, book your ticket, help us share with loved ones so as to be part of this. And don't forget to subscribe to YouTube channel and share the page. Let more people be aware of the course. So thank you once again for those of you that join us on YouTube. Please subscribe and click the notification button so that you'll be able to be the first to hear when the video new one being uh, uploaded or we are live. Once again, thank you for joining. Uh, we'll see you again, those of you on YouTube. We'll 